Testing. All right, you got to use this one. I have to use this one. Good evening. Y'all, listen, I am a I am a charismatic Pentecostal preacher. For those of you that don't know what that means, when we speak, the audience speaks back to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There you go. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? Oh, good. It's good to be here. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. I, I do not take it for granted that you have taken the time to be here. And um, if you are, if you are eating, that's fine, of course. But I want to do something. I'm not a, you know. I know typically public speaking, you're supposed to start with some type of icebreaker joke. I'm not good with rehearsed comedy. I'm just either it happens or it doesn't for me. But I'm not good at standing still either, or it does it for me. So, um, but, but I want to do something, uh, and that is just simply let's uh, celebrate the person on our left or right by just clapping your hands for them being here. There you go. There you go. Now, if you don't know the person uh, that you're clapping for, that's fine because we're going to speak to them in, in various ways. Now, you can speak to them in one of a few ways. If you are comfortable waving, you're going to wave at them. Go ahead and wave at them. That's, there you go. Now, don't only wave at your table. Wave across the room at somebody. Yeah. Now, if, if I can find uh, an African-American African -American brother, if we were walking in the room, I see I see my good friend Bobby Black back there. If we were in the room, we would just, there you go, <laughs> there you go. And uh, that, is, that is our way of speaking when, without waving a hand. So y'all do that across the room for me. That's right, that's right. Now, now you can't be stiff with it, can't be this. It's got to be, yeah, 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 just real loose. So one more time, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. And then the other would be, Especially when we're eating and everything, you don't, don't want to, you know, just be shaking hands with everybody. A lot of, lot of jerks and everything. So we just fist pump. So let's 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 give everybody a little. That's what I'm talking about. Just a little fist pump. Everybody shout all right there. I want to start by acknowledging a few people. Uh, I don't see Angela McGee today, but I uh, I really want to thank her for the work she's doing and uh, and and want to give her a great big old applause from here that may reverberate all the way down to Columbia. So let's give her a great big old applause. Applause. For her. I also want to say a big thank you to Mr. William Renfro for all the work that he does. William, of course, you'll hear from when I'm done, and he is instrumental in getting us all together. And, uh, and I think that's worthy of a great big old celebratory applause. <laughs> thank you, sir. And then my good friend who spoke so well of me, Mr. Josh Kimbrell, uh, who is so gracious to MC week in, week out, month in, month out. Josh Kimbrell, we celebrate you. So let's do this. I want to talk a little bit, I want to talk twofold. I want to talk a little bit about myself, and then I want to talk a little bit about some guiding principles and, and you know, hopefully something will be said that you can take back to what you do in the marketplace. Uh, ultimately, uh, my goal is not to share my whole story because it is way too complex. It is, it is a story that is way too complex, but I want to sort of tell you a, a little bit about what guides me every day and what I hope guides us as a community. Everybody shout all right then. Y'all right. say it louder because I'm a preacher. Say it louder. All right, then. Yeah, this is not the meeting where you won't get to talk. You will talk back to me. So watch this. So I am a guy, and, and, and I'm not ready to slide yet. I am a guy who, who, who grew up uh, the oldest son of Mr. James White Sr. and Miss Deborah uh, Jackson now, but White uh, at, also. My mom and dad were... Um, Pentecostal preachers. He was a pastor. My mom was what we call state evangelist. Uh, and they, uh, they, we, we traveled all around um, the state of South Carolina all the time. It was all day church, guys. I mean, like Sunday, you know, like how you guys, you know, you go to church, have the 8 a.m. thing. Yeah, out by nine, you get to go play golf and catch the game. We would be, we would be making our way home somewhere around 11 or 12 at night. From, 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 I'm talking about from 10 a.m. service. Now y'all looking at me like, like I'm gonna keep y'all here that long, but, but I'm probably, <laughs> y'all looking like, okay, is, have you been delivered from that or where is this going? But, but no, just, just want you to understand a little bit. So, so early on, 
The church is what we did, it was. We had, we had Sunday school, we had Sunday morning service. Our Sunday morning service would start around 11 and we would be ready for, for dinner somewhere around three. Uh, we, 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 the preacher didn't get up to somewhere around a quarter to one or one fifteen, somewhere in there. Uh, a lot of jumping, a lot of shouting, a lot, a lot of good stuff. And uh, and then he would preach for an hour, 15, 30 minutes, totally contingent upon what happens while he's speaking. And and then we would go home, catch a bite to eat, and then we would have to come back for YPWW, Young People Willing Workers, before we had our Sunday evening pastoral teaching. It was quite a bit of church. My mom and dad were my heroes, and so early on, my mom and dad, my dad had a masonry company, and he was a uh, pastor, and so it was clear that I would preach one day. It was clear. I went to work. My dad, we, I grew up, my dad, hey, I want the new Jordans that just came out. I'm going to work in a little bit. You want Jordans, you have to go to work. And so we had to go, and my dad taught me the trade of laying brick. And every time, I, every time I do it and it's really hot outside, I really wonder why my dad was not a doctor, a lawyer, something except for a Brit Mason. But he is what he is and we are what we are. So anyway, um, my mom and dad, right around the time I was 14, I'm just about ready to go into high school, my mom and dad called my brother, my sister and I in and they say to us, um, we are not going to make it as a couple anymore. So imagine my world and what I was going through at the age of 14, trying to understand how it is that a man and woman who appears to love God enough to keep us in church all night. <laughs> they, love, they love God so much that they can keep us in church all day and night. And I didn't understand how is it they could love God that much and not learn to love one another. And it was a tough, tough time for me. I was the oldest of my brother and sister, and so I went through a season of total rebellion. Total rebellion. I was not in this suit. It was all-out rebellion. I insisted on leaving my mom and dad's house, moving to North Carolina with my grandmother, who has uh, 15 biological children. Fifteen. I know. Wow. That's right. 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 Yeah. My my grandmother would go back to the doctor after having one child, and the doctor would say, "It's your six week checkup time, Miss Jackson." And and he said, "Miss Jackson, whoa, 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 whoa. Six week checkup means you and Mr. Jackson haven't been doing anything, but you're pregnant. So how how is that possible?" And uh, so she would go back and she would be praying. So she had 15 children over, over a lifetime. And then once my mom and dad divorced, my, my grandmother, being the lady she is, welcomed me in to her project apartment. It was a four bedroom apartment in which about eight, nine, ten of us at one time lived. We lived in there, needless to say, if you're trying to parent 10 plus children, you cannot manage all of them, keep your eye on all of them, so the streets raised us. We, we didn't have a lot of accountability, wasn't a lot of talk about homework, heck, we didn't go to school if we didn't want to. We got up and we hung out. And in the culture in which we hung out in, there was a whole lot of everything that you don't want your children to be a part of. Y'all listening to me? Y'all are quiet. I don't know if that means I have your attention or y'all just um, waiting for me to get done. Y'all say, we with you. So we went through a process of, 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 of raising ourselves. I'm in total rebellion. I didn't want to have much to do with God. I was still a little angry. And, uh, and so we, we did the streets for a while. And I mean all out streets. I don't have time to go into all of it. But we did it all. We did it all. It was our culture. It was what we grew up in. And then one day, as I fast forward, I came to know for real, not prescribed to me. I think of Jesus Christ, I think of Christianity in two ways. I think of it when it becomes real to you and when it becomes real to me. And then I think of it when it's prescribed. And before um, my, my Damascus Road experience, I had what was called prescribed Christianity. My mom, I didn't have an option to go. I had to go. Y'all listening to me? And so I had my Damascus Road experience. I was, I've been living with the lady who is my wife now. I've been living with her 
for five years and I was never going to marry her because that's just not what we did. I was, we were together out of convenience. She, she would tell you if she were here, she was never going to marry me, although she had an engagement ring. And then one day we had a Damascus Road experience, gave my life to Jesus Christ for real. And immediately we sat down a road uh, to, to honor him um, in our living. In doing so, we ended up moving from North Carolina down to South Carolina. This is very humbling. We moved in with my mother into her back room um, house, the back room of her house. We had two children at the time with us. Um, Alex, who was over here, my daughter Bria, who was taking exams at USC, at USC Upstate right now, and they were with us in one bed, boy, girl, and my wife and I were in the back and we were trying to find our way. We did not have enough money to even get in an apartment. We had wasted much of our lives. We didn't have an education because once again, I barely went to high school. As a matter of fact, my, my last year in high school was so tumultuous that the principal, they literally called me in and said, hey, you've missed almost 70 days from school, your senior year. And I said, okay, I'm coming back next year anyway. I mean, you know, coming in here every now and then is cool to me. And they said, hey, here's the deal. If you can pass your exams, we've already talked to your teachers. Will you just take the exams? I said, yeah. They said, if you can pass them, you out. I said, all right, cool. Took my exams, I passed all of them, they say, and I got a diploma. <laughs> I didn't ask for the transcripts, you don't call and ask for them, they said I passed. <laughs> and so, I left there, and, uh, and then like I said, we, we, we did, we did uh, a lot of, a lot of just things that we're not proud of from that point on. Here's, here's the point I'm trying to get to. Once I encountered Jesus Christ, I became very serious about the book he had handed me to, to guide my life. Very serious about the book. I began to eat it day and night. I began to meditate upon it, like the Bible says in Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Started to eat it day and night. And I came across a passage that really started to define who I am as an individual. And it's found in Proverbs 12, 26, and it should be up on the monitors, and it's in your notes um, that are on your table. And it simply says that the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduces or causes them to go astray. Consider this passage. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it says the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. More excellent. Everybody say that with me. More say it again. More excellent than his neighbor. In other words, the righteous man, the man of God, the woman of God, they get up and they do life differently than their neighbor. The culture does not define them. As a matter of fact, this verse is so powerful that it suggests to us that the culture will seduce you if you're not intentional about living different, about pursuing a more excellent way. <laughs> Some years ago, we went through a branding process at our church, and then our, during our branding process, we were going through uh, talking about what defines us, and as they talked to different members, everyone kept coming back. We had several different models, but everyone kept coming back with this theme of excellence. And so we literally changed and branded ourselves new life of excellence. Because we recognize first and foremost, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. So we knew that, and listen, if we're going to reach our culture, that we're going to have to offer people new life in Jesus Christ. Because many people struggle in life, but they think they have to get the, themselves together. And the truth of the matter is, I am a living witness. You do not have that ability. But Jesus Christ can. And so then, thank you, thank you, Cher, thank you, Cher. He said, Cher's been to a few church, Pentecost church. He says, all right, did. I, I was, I'm ready for it to say, bring it home, Ray. bring it home, Ray. All right, so watch this. So, 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 so we, we offer a new life, but then I come across this passage that says, the excellent, the, the uh, righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. Man, that's powerful. Consider these words. It's not up here, but Psalms chapter 8, verse 1, twice. In nine verses says something to us that you can't forget. It says to us, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. How 
excellence down there. It says that the name that we represent and proclaim is a name that is marked by excellence. The Bible also suggests to us, it is in your notes, in Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, that there was this young man who we'll end with talking about, there was this young man named Daniel. He was taken into captivity, Babylonian captivity. He is in slavery, if you will. He is, he is in slavery. He is, he is taken against his will. He watches the group that took him plunder the house of God that he worshiped in, and yet in bondage and in slavery, the Bible says about him that Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was found in him. Man, excellence is powerful. <laughs> I said it's powerful. Because when you when you began to define yourself by excellence, what it means is, is that you don't get up and just give an effort, you give an excellent effort. In other words, you live your life every day to do something that is crucial, that is important, and that is that you must every day seek to overcome your past failures. Because all of us have some in here. That's a good place to say amen. We overcome our past failures, we outdo our past successes, and we overcome despite our present limitations. That's what excellence means for us at New Life. We, we do that every single day. We have to over achieve despite our present limitations. And all of us have limitations in life, in, in relationships, in business, we all have some. So what I want to do is give you some requirements of excellence and let's see if it helps to, to shape what excellence looks like. Everybody shout, we're with you. Please say it again. Real quick before I do that, go to the next slide, go to the slide of, this, this, this is, this, I want to show you this because when, when, when I was telling you about me with my grandmother's 15 children, 10, 8, 9, 10 of us in the same apartment, in, in Livingston Street Apartments, here's what she used to say. She had the cleanest place in the whole project, always has. And she would always say to us, it's not where you live, it's how you live that matters. It's not where you live, it's how you live that matters. In other words, she was modeling for us that excellence can really be a model, but it's, it's not where you live, it's how you live. Everybody say that with me, it's not. Now imagine if we could just get that to, our, to, 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 to many people in our culture. That who, we don't care where you come from. It only matters what you do with what you have to work with. Y'all listening to me? So next slide is my personal motto and, oh, that's Ma right there. She would kill me if she knew she was on this screen right here. That is, that is Ma right there headed to church last Sunday uh, because even in her late 80s, early 90s, I, she, she says that the midwife gave her one birthday, her mama put another birthday on her birth certificate, so we have to celebrate too. <laughs> it's what you get to do when you ma. Keep going, next slide. So my personal motto, motto has become just simply, it's not what you do, it's whether you do it with excellence that matters. It's not what you do, it's whether you do it with excellence.